Hey guys, and welcome back to Firestarters, the channel dedicated to telling you tales of the greatest heroes in the universe, the saints. And welcome to part three of the incredible story of Fatima, where we will be talking about life for the three children after the apparitions that took place from May through October of 1917. We will also be talking about more apparitions that continue to happen after the October 1917 apparition. We will also be talking about some amazing miracle stories, more on the secret of Fatima, and we will be talking a lot more about life for Lucia dos Santos as she grew older and became a Carmelite nun until her death in 2005. So, without further ado, let's get into today's video. All right, so quick recap. We ended part two with the October 13th apparition in 1917, in which the 70,000 people all gathered at the Covid area. This included people from all around the world, reporters from the New York Times, and reporters from the Portuguese newspaper O Seculo to witness this miracle that Our Lady said she was going to perform in this apparition. During this October apparition, a series of spectacular things occur. Number one, the lady reveals her identity, and she reveals it as Our Lady of the Rosary. So she is the Mother of God, the Blessed Mother, in the form of Our Lady of the Rosary. And she says that a chapel is to be built there at the Cova de Iria in her honor. She also reiterated how important it was to pray the rosary every single day. And when Lucia asked her to cure some sick persons, she clearly responded, Some yes, but not others. They must amend their lives and ask forgiveness of their sins. And then Our Lady, looking very sad, said, Do not offend the Lord God anymore because he is already so much offended. And this is the moment when the light shone from her hands and she projected her own light onto the sun. During this light projection, two spectacular things would happen, the most important of which, the children behold Saint Joseph holding the child Jesus with the Blessed Mother, so the Holy Family blessing the world, making the sign of the cross onto the world. And then after that, they see our Lord Jesus Christ with our Blessed Mother in the form of Our Lady of Sorrows doing the same thing, tracing the sign of the cross, blessing the world again. And then they see Our Lady appear again in the form of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. The other spectacular event that happened during this apparition, which was witnessed by the 70,000 other people that were there, was the insane Miracle of the Sun, or Sundance, as it was famously dubbed, in which the sun zigged and zagged across the sky. It appeared to approach the earth and recede. It was casting multicolored lights across the sky. Everybody thought it was the end of the world. And if you remember from part two, it had been raining all morning and the ground was wet, it was muddy, everybody's clothes were wet, and after this sun dance, everybody's clothes were completely dry and the ground was dry as if on a hot summer day. Now after this miracle from October of 1917, these three little children were bombarded with interrogations from people who traveled all around the world and thousands upon thousands of people traveled to Fatima seeking to pray with the children, asking for intercession to heal all kinds of ailments. Physical ailments, mental ailments, family quarreling, and some pretty unbelievable miracles to actually happen through the children. And I'm going to share a couple of the coolest ones with you right now. A woman afflicted with a terrible disease came to the children weeping, and she knelt down before Jacinta and begged for her intercession with Our Lady to cure her. So Jacinta knelt down with her and prayed three Hail Marys and assured her that she would be cured. And sometime later, the woman returned, her disease completely gone, and she thanked the children and Our Lady for the cure. On another occasion, a soldier came weeping and pleading to the children that he wouldn't have to leave his sick wife and three children to go off to war. And Jacinta said to him, Don't cry, Our Lady is so good. She will certainly grant you the grace that you are asking. And months later, he appeared again to the children. 
and apparently the night before he was supposed to ship off to war, he had come down with a really bad fever and was released from military service. And his wife was also miraculously cured. So, now this next miracle story is both peculiar and incredible. A local woman named Senhora Emilia, who was a widow, invited the children to come and pray the rosary at her house. And the children agreed, and on their way to her house, they were stopped by another woman who begged the children to come and pray the rosary with her at her house. And so the children said, well, you know, it's funny you should say that because we're on our way to pray the rosary right now at Senhora Emilia's house. And she said, please, I want you to come pray the rosary at my house right now. She was insistent. And so the children agreed, okay, we'll go pray the rosary at your house. And so on their way, they were stopped by another woman. According to Sister Lucia's memoirs, it was a young woman about 20 years old and weeping. She knelt down and begged the children to enter their house and say at least one Hail Mary for the recovery of her father, who for three years had been unable to take any rest on account of continual hiccups like actual hiccups, like, you know, from your throat. You know, I don't know if there's a medical term for it or not. Can you imagine three years of annoying, uncontrollable hiccups? Anyways, they helped the young woman to her feet, and Lucia asked Jacinta if she would like to stay behind and pray with the young woman and her family while Lucia goes to the other family to pray the rosary, and Jacinta agreed. After Lucia prayed the rosary with the other family, she returned to the house where Jacinta went in with the crying young woman and her father with the continual hiccups. And when she went into the house, she found Jacinta sitting in front of an older man who looked exhausted, sleep deprived, anxious. Lucia writes in her memoirs that he looked emaciated and he was weeping with emotion and he was surrounded by other people, presumably family members. Upon seeing Lucia, Jacinta got up and said goodbye and promised the man that she would not forget him in her prayers. Then they returned to Senhora Emilia's house. Now early the next morning, they left Senhora Emilia's house, but then returned to her house three days later. And when they returned, they found the happy girl accompanied by her father, the father with the continual hiccups. And according to Lucia's memoirs, he now looked much better, had lost all trace of nervous strain and extreme weakness, and they came to thank us for the grace they had received, for they said he was no longer troubled by the annoying hiccups. All right, one more miracle story, and this one is truly remarkable because it is almost word for word a prodigal son story. Lucia had a relative named Aunt Vittoria who was married and had a son, a young man living in Fatima. And the son had stolen a large sum of the family's money and ran away from home. And Aunt Vittoria came to Jacinta and asked her to pray for her son's return. Now, after this young man had stolen his parents' money and ran away from home, he basically squandered it. I mean, like I said, perfect prodigal son story. And he eventually landed himself in jail. And after he had spent a good amount of time in jail, he actually managed to escape. After escaping, he wandered through the pine woods alone and became completely lost on a dark and stormy night. And in despair, he began to pray. All of a sudden, Jacinta appeared next to him and took him by the hand and led him to a road which she pointed would lead him home. And he did as Jacinta directed, and he returned home to his family. And after all this, Lucia asked Jacinta, how in the world did you wander in the middle of these pine woods and find this young man? Jacinta simply replied, I only prayed and pleaded very much with Our Lady for him because I felt so sorry for Aunt Vittoria. Lucia then asked, how then did it happen? And she replied, I don't know, only God knows. There are so many other little miracle stories like this, but if I were to include all of them, this video would never end. So we're gonna move on with the story. Now, after the October 13th apparition with the 70,000 people witnessing the miracle of the sun, you would think that maybe the government would stop bothering the children as much and their lives would become a little bit easier, but that was not the case. 
Lucia would continue to receive death threats, insults, and taunts, and one day she was on her way to the Covidi area to pray the rosary when she was seized by two cavalrymen and ordered to return home. And they were near some open trenches, and one of the soldiers tauntingly suggested, here, let us cut off her head with one of our swords and leave her dead and buried. That way we'll be done with this whole ordeal once and for all. The soldiers brought her back to her parents' house where she was ordered to stay indoors. And these soldiers were constantly trying to ward off people from praying at the Covida area, but to no avail due to the sheer number of the people that would constantly flock and make pilgrimages to the Covida area to pray the rosary. To make matters even worse, Lucia's mother became seriously ill, and her <laughs> sisters put the blame all on her, saying, she's going to die of grief because of all the trouble you've given her. And they kind of jokingly suggested, why don't you go to the COVID area and ask the lady to cure her, then maybe we'll believe. Lucia ran out of the house crying, and she began praying the rosary, and she eventually made her way to the COVID area and made her request with Our Lady. And when she returned home, Amazingly, her mother was feeling better, and Lucia recalls her mother saying, How strange. Our Lady cured me, and somehow I still don't believe. Here's the amazing thing. Whenever Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta experienced great pain and sorrow, they would simply offer it up as a sacrifice for the love of Jesus, conversion of sinners, and reparations for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart, as Our Lady told them to do back on that apparition on the 13th of May. Lucia recalls that Jacinta exemplified the spirit of mortification and sacrifice the most out of the three children. She writes in her memoirs, Jacinta took this matter of making sacrifices for the conversion of sinners so much to heart that she never let a single opportunity escape her. She would eat bitter fruit, give away her lunch to poor children, drink dirty water, etc. And whenever she experienced any pain, she'd offered it up for the conversion of sinners. Now, I'm sure you've noticed at this point that I've mentioned a lot about Lucia and Jacinta, but not quite as much about Francisco. And the simple reason for that being Francisco was slow to speak, he wasn't a talker, and he valued solitude. Lucia recalls that his spirit of sacrifice and mortification was strong like his sister, but he was different in that he loved solitude and prayer. Lucia and Jacinta would often find him by himself thinking about the Lord, as Francisco would say. If you remember what I said in part one, Francisco loved being by himself to pray, and he was quite fond of birds. You know, he was like a little Saint Francis. Francisco also developed a deep love for the rosary. And as you might recall from part two, where I talked about the first apparition of Our Lady, the May 13th apparition, when Lucia asked Our Lady, shall Francisco go to heaven? She replied, he will, but he must say many rosaries. And when Lucia told this to Francisco, he boldly replied, My lady, I shall say as many rosaries as you wish. Lucia also talked about how Francisco had no fear of death. And you might recall from the June 13th apparition when Our Lady shone the light from her hands and Lucia was part of a light being poured upon the earth while Francisco and Jacinta were part of a light rising up to heaven. And what this meant was that Francisco and Jacinta were going to die soon. And Lucia detailed that Francisco showed no fear of this. When he began getting sick, he never complained, and Lucia described him as having heroic patience. She writes, He spoke very little, he usually did everything he saw us doing, and rarely suggested anything himself. In October of 1918, so one year after that last apparition of Our Lady with the miracle of the sun, Jacinta would fall ill, and Francisco soon after. And Francisco and Jacinta would experience their own private apparition of Our Lady. She spoke to the children, saying that she would be taking Francisco to heaven very soon, and asked Jacinta if she wanted to convert more sinners, to which she replied, yes. And she told Jacinta that she would be transported to a hospital where she would suffer a great deal. Now, after this began a new phase for the three children, for Lucia, she began going to school at the request of her mother, which is actually a fulfillment of Our Lady's wishes. As you might recall from the June 13th apparition, Our Lady's wishes for Lucia to learn to read. And for Francisco and Jacinta, they began preparations to die and be taken up into heaven. 
When Lucia began going to school every day, Francisco would go to church to accompany the hidden Jesus, or the tabernacle, and he would spend all day in prayer in front of the tabernacle, the physical body of Christ, waiting for Lucia to get home from school every day. Francisco's condition would worsen to the point where he lost his ability to walk and eventually became confined to his bed, and Lucia detailed that through even the most serious times of his illness, that he appeared joyful and content. When Francisco's condition became critical, his sister Teresa called Lucia over as Francisco wanted to privately speak with Lucia. So she got dressed as quickly as possible and rushed over to her aunt and uncle's house to Francisco's bedside. He told Lucia with what little strength he had left, I am going to confession so that I can receive Holy Communion, then die. I want you to tell me if you have seen me commit any sin, and then go and ask Jacinta if she had seen me commit any. He's asking them to help him do a really thorough examination of conscience before he dies. I mean, can you imagine a 10-year-old boy saying, I'm going to confession so that I can receive Holy Communion, and then die? The kid's a friggin' warrior. He made his confession and then received Holy Communion on the following day, and he spoke to his sister Jacinta, saying, I am happier than you are because I have the hidden Jesus within my heart. I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to pray very much to our Lord and Our Lady for them to bring you both there soon. Lucia and Jacinta spent the entire day at his bedside, and as he did not have the strength to pray, he asked them to pray the rosary for him, which they did. Lucia then spoke her last words to Francisco and said, Goodbye, Francisco. If you go to heaven tonight, don't forget me when you get there. And he said, no, I won't forget. Be sure of that. Francisco died on April 4th, 1919. Lucia writes, I could never describe how much I missed him. The grief was a thorn that pierced my heart for years to come. It is a memory of the past that echoes forever unto eternity. So Francisco's death, while extremely difficult to bear, Lucia and Jacinta knew it was coming. They kind of had this emotional preparation for Francisco to die and go to heaven, as Our Lady had told Lucia that she was going to bring Francisco and Jacinta to heaven soon. What Lucia was not prepared for, however, was another family death. All right, so before I continue, I need to make a quick mention that the year is 1919. So in case you guys aren't aware, in 1918, the worst pandemic in modern history, the Spanish flu, also called the Purple Death, encircled the globe, killed about 21 million people. Some sources say even closer to 100 million people. So it's the worst pandemic since the bubonic plague that happened in the Middle Ages. The United States alone suffered 675,000 deaths to the Spanish flu, which is more than the American military deaths of World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War combined. Something unique about this pandemic is that the mortality rate was high in healthy people between the ages of 20 and 40 years old. So it was quite common in that time for young, perfectly healthy people just to get sick suddenly and die. So back to the story. Tragically, at the end of July 1919, Lucia's father became suddenly deathly ill. Lucia writes, My father was a healthy man and robust. He said he had never known what it was to have a headache, but in less than 24 hours, an attack of double pneumonia carried him off into eternity. And he died on the 31st of July 1919. So I've not mentioned a whole lot about Lucia's father, Antonio dos Santos, but Lucia writes something profound about him in her memoirs. He was the only one who never failed to show himself to be my friend, and the only one who defended me when disputes arose at home on account of me. Lucia mentions that her sorrow was so great she thought she would die of grief. I mean, this is a 12-year-old we're talking about who just lost her best friend and her father in the span of four months. She continued recalling the words of Our Lady from that first apparition back in May when she said that she would suffer a great deal. And she wrote in her memoirs, My God, my God, I never thought you had so much suffering in store for me, but I suffer for love of you and reparation for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary, for the Holy Father, and for the conversion of sinners. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Francisco and Jacinta became sick around the same time. So while all this is happening, Jacinta becomes so ill that she is now confined to her bed. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, back in October 1918, Jacinta and Francisco received a private apparition of Our Lady in which she said that she would be taking them both to heaven very soon. She asked Jacinta if she wanted to suffer more for the conversion of sinners, which she replied yes, and that she would be transported to a hospital where she would suffer a great deal. In July 1st of 1919, Jacinta was sent to St. Augustine's Hospital in Villanova de Aurem. Now, when Jacinta's mother, Olympia, would be spending time with her in the hospital, she would ask Jacinta if she wanted or needed anything, and she would simply respond, I want to see Lucia. And so she would bring Lucia to the hospital with her to visit Jacinta. Jacinta's mother would ask Lucia if she could stay with Jacinta while she went to do the shopping for the family, which she eagerly agreed. Now, during this time they spent together in the hospital, Lucia asked Jacinta if she was suffering a great deal, to which she replied, Yes, I am, but I offer everything for sinners and in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Lucia talks about just how joyful Jacinta was during this whole time, that all she could talk about was how glad she was to suffer for the love of our good God and the Immaculate Heart of Mary for sinners and the Holy Father. Something I need to mention real quick is that Jacinta is in the hospital because she had contracted a serious case of influenza. I already talked about the Spanish flu outbreak in 1918, and Jacinta's case had worsened to the point that the infection in her lungs had spread to two of her ribs, and the doctors actually determined that those ribs needed to be surgically removed. The only problem was the doctors did not have the medicine to put her to sleep, and so they had to surgically remove the two infected ribs while she was awake the entire time. I should also mention really quick that while Jacinta was being treated at St. Augustine's Hospital, she would often refuse things like milk and water because, as she often said, I want to suffer for the conversion of sinners. She would also be found often embracing a crucifix while in bed. It just makes me think, like, remember that time I was really sick and I was complaining about it? And then I think about Jacinta Marto and I'm just like, well, I guess I should offer it up. On August 31st of 1919, she was released from St. Augustine's Hospital and allowed to return home. Now, after she returned home, she had this surgical wound in her chest, which had to be treated constantly, which she bore without complaint. The only thing that distressed her was the continued interrogations of all these people wanting to continue to question Lucia and Jacinta about the apparitions. She had also lost so much of her strength that she could barely walk, and she could no longer walk with Lucia to the cabeza to pray the rosary, which is something they did very often. And with tears in her eyes, she would beg Lucia, when you go to the COVID area, please pray for me. Jacinta's mother, Olympia, would say to Lucia's mother, the life of these children is an enigma to me. And Lucia's mother, Maria, would agree saying, yes, I just can't understand all this mystery. Now, even after the surgery, Jacinta's condition only continued to grow worse, but she would receive a personal apparition of the Blessed Virgin. She described it to Lucia saying, she told me that I am going to Lisbon to another hospital, that I will not see you again, nor my parents either, and after suffering a great deal, I shall die alone. But she said I must not be afraid, since she herself is coming to take me to heaven. And the next couple of months would be an extremely difficult time of emotional suffering for Lucia and Jacinta as they were preparing to say farewell to each other, at least until they meet next in heaven. Lucia writes that Jacinta suffered terribly right up until the day of her departure for Lisbon. She would cling to her and sob, saying, I'll never see you again, nor my mother, nor my brothers, nor my father. I'll never see anybody ever again, and then I'll die alone. And Lucia would tell her, don't think about it. But she would say, let me think about it. For the more I think about it, the more I suffer, and I want to suffer for love of our Lord and for sinners. It's just like this little girl is otherworldly. Embracing and kissing a crucifix, Jacinta exclaimed, Oh Jesus, now you can convert many sinners because this is a really big sacrifice. When Jacinta's mother would cry, looking at her so sick in her bed, Jacinta would reply, Don't worry, mother, I'm going to heaven, and there I'll be praying so much for you. When the day of her departure came, Jacinta spoke her last words to Lucia when she said, We shall never see each other again. Pray a lot for me until I go to heaven then I will pray a lot for you. Never tell the secret to anyone, even if they kill you. Love Jesus in the Immaculate Heart of Mary very much and make many sacrifices for sinners. 
On January 21st, 1920, Jacinta was taken to Lisbon where she was admitted to the orphanage run by Madre Gurgino. And on February 2nd, she was transferred to Dona Estefania Hospital. And while she was there, she wrote Lucia one final letter in which she told her that Our Lady had visited her and told her the exact hour and day of her death. And she also reminded Lucia to be very good. Jacinta died on February 20th, 1920 at 10.30 p.m. So this intense wave of grief sweeps over not only Lucia, but the Marto family with the loss of Jacinta and Francisco and Lucia's family as they are continuing to mourn the loss of their father. Lucia would spend hours visiting the grave sites of her father and Francisco, as well as visit the Cabeso where she had spent so much time with Francisco and Jacinta. I can't even fathom the intense loneliness and grief that Lucia was feeling at this point, or maybe I just don't want to. Now, being the last surviving child of the three, Lucia was greatly admired by some. Some even considered her to be saint-like. She was still accused by others of hypocrisy or even sorcery. And Lucia said in her memoirs that this was the good Lord's way of throwing salt into the water to prevent it from going bad. Throughout the next several months of this intense grieving period, Lucia's mother, who was still grieving the loss of her own husband, saw just how much suffering Lucia was going through with the loss of her two cousins and her father. And on top of that, all of the continued interrogations from the government and from random strangers all around the world. And so she decided as a mother, she needed to do something to take care of her daughter. She took Lucia to Lisbon to a man named Dr. Formigao, who was one of the priests who interviewed the children in 1917 about the apparitions. And he arranged for them to meet with a woman named Dona Asunção Avelar. And I don't know if I pronounced that name right. This woman gave Lucia and her mother a generous offer to pay for a boarding school for Lucia with the Dorothean sisters in Spain, an offer that they generously accepted and they remained several days with Dr. Formigao, who hid them from the government who was looking for Lucia. All right, so a couple things right here. Number one, I love that Lucia's mother is being a total mama bear right here. She hasn't believed Lucia this entire time about the apparitions, yet here she is now taking care of her daughter, giving her a path of healing from all of her suffering and protecting her from more interrogations. Secondly, I love that this priest, Dr. Formigao, is helping Lucia and her mother literally hide from the government from more interrogations. He's just like, you guys have been through enough. And he also played a huge part in making the Fatima message known to the world. He's known as the Apostle of Fatima, and his cause for beatification was open on April 14th, 2016. And here is a picture of Manuel Nunes Formigao, right here. Lucia met with the Bishop of Leira and several other priests before she was allowed admittance to the boarding school and her new life. Lucia said that this new course in her life distracted her from all the grief she had been experiencing in the previous months. She quoted in her memoirs, the oppressive sadness began to disappear. On June 16, 1921, at 2 o'clock in the morning, Lucia, with her mother, left their home in Aljustrel and they stopped at the Cova de Iria where Lucia prayed her rosary there one last time. Now it was at this moment that Our Lady actually appeared to Lucia for a seventh time. So let's rewind real quick four years and go to the 13th of May 1917 at the first apparition of Our Lady when she told Lucia, I have come to ask you to come here for six months in succession on the 13th day at the same hour. Later on, I will tell you who I am and what I want. Afterwards, I will return here yet a seventh time. Well, here you go. Now, Lucia does not mention much about this apparition as it is believed it was a very personal message meant only for her. But the general consensus is that Our Lady was giving Lucia the blessing, saying it was the will of God for her to continue her life at the boarding school with the Sisters of St. Dorothy. They arrived in Lera at 9 a.m. where they met a woman named Donna Filomena Miranda who would accompany Lucia for the rest of the journey, and she would also become Lucia's godmother later at her confirmation. Lucia writes, The train left at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and there I was at the station, giving my poor mother a last embrace, leaving her overwhelmed with sorrow and shedding abundant tears. The train moved out, 
and with it went my poor heart plunged in an ocean of loneliness and filled with memories that I could never forget. The following morning, Lucia arrived at the College of Porto in northern Portugal, which is where Lucia would spend the next four years going to school. After these four years, she entered the Institute of the Sisters of St. Dorothy as a postulant in the convent in Pontevedra, Spain, just north of the northern Portuguese border, on October 24th, 1925. Alright, so starting from part one of this Fatima series to now, we've covered a lot of events in just a 10-year time span, starting from the apparitions of the angel in 1915 to Lucia joining the Dorothean sisters in 1925. So now, the pace of this video is going to change quite a bit as we are going to cover from the year 1925 when Lucia joins the Dorothean sisters all the way until her death in 2005, so 80 years of events. Please stick with me because we are going to talk about some amazing apparitions that Sister Lucia has as a nun, plus specific details about the secret of Fatima. The first of these apparitions happened on December 10th, 1925, less than three months after she entered the convent. While she was praying, Our Lady appeared to her with a child next to her elevated on a cloud, and she rested her hand on Lucia's shoulder. In her other hand, she held up a heart encircled by thorns. The elevated child then spoke to her, saying, have compassion on the heart of your most holy mother, covered with thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment, and there is no one to make an act of reparation to remove them. Then the most holy virgin said, Look, my daughter, at my heart, surrounded with thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce me every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. You at least try to console me and say that I promise to assist at the hour of death with the graces necessary for salvation. All those who, on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, shall confess, receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the Rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the Rosary with the intention of making reparation to me. So you guys might recall from the July 13th apparition of 1917, Our Lady said, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. Now we're going to talk about the consecration of Russia in just a little bit, but right here in this December apparition, Our Lady is clearly defining to Lucia the communion of first Saturdays. That on the first Saturday of five consecutive months to go to confession, receive Holy Communion, to pray the Rosary, and to meditate for 15 minutes on the 15 decades of the Rosary. Now, around the time of this apparition, Lucia had met a little boy in the vegetable garden of the convent. Now, if I would have seen this kid, I would have just been like, uh, why are you here alone? Where are your parents? But Lucia simply asked him, do you know how to pray the Hail Mary? To which he replied, yes. And so she asked him to pray aloud one Hail Mary, but he remained silent, presumably because he was shy. And so she knelt down and prayed three Hail Marys aloud with him and then asked him once again to pray aloud a Hail Mary, but he still remained silent. And so she asked him, do you know where the church of Santa Maria is located? And he replied, yes, I do. And so she asked him, I want you to go to that church and pray, oh, my heavenly mother, give me the child Jesus. And with that, he ran off and did as she said. Now, a couple of months go by, and it's February 15th, 1926. She's in the same vegetable garden of the convent, and the same little boy appeared to her once again. Lucia asked him, Did you ask our Heavenly Mother for the child Jesus? And the child turned to her and said, And have you spread through the world what our Heavenly Mother requested of you? And as he said these words, he transformed into a resplendent child, and Lucia, knowing that it was the child Jesus, said to him, My Jesus, you know very well what my confessor said to me in the letter I read to you. He told me that it was necessary for this vision to be repeated for further happenings to prove its credibility. And he added that Mother Superior on her own could do nothing to propagate this devotion. And the child Jesus responded, It is true your Superior alone can do nothing, but with my grace she can do all. It is enough that your confessor gives you permission and that your superiors speak of it for it to be believed, even without people knowing to whom it has been revealed. 
So Lucia is having a conversation with the child Jesus and asking him how to spread this first Saturday's devotion throughout the world. And he's telling her to trust in his grace. And then he gives her clear instructions. He says, it is enough for your confessor to give you permission and that your superior speak of it for it to be believed. It's just like, trust me, speak of it. There's also two main key points. Lucia asks him, but what about the people who can't make confession on Saturdays? Would it be valid for them to go to confession within eight days? And Jesus answers, yes, it could be longer still, provided that when they receive me, they are in a state of grace and they have the intention of making reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Jesus speaks to her with another point and says, it is true, my daughter, that many souls begin the first Saturdays, but few finish them. And those who do complete them do so in order to receive the graces that are promised thereby. It would please me more if they did five with fervor and with the intention of making reparation to the heart of your heavenly mother than if they did 15 in a tepid and indifferent manner. Now, if you think about this, any loving parent would tell this to their children. I want you to obey me simply because you love me. I don't want you to obey me because I'll give you a cookie. I mean, as awesome as cookies are. All right, so a couple of months goes by and on July 20th, 1926, Lucia moved to the Spanish town of Tui where she began her novitiate and she professed her first vows on October 3rd of 1928. And while in her convent in Tui on June 13th, 1929, Lucia experienced another extraordinary apparition. Lucia was in the chapel of the convent, making a holy hour from 11 p.m. to midnight, when suddenly the whole chapel was illuminated by supernatural light, and above the altar appeared a cross of light. On the upper part of the cross, there was a face of a man and his body. Down to the waist and upon his chest was a dove also of light. Nailed to the cross was the body of another man, with blood dripping from his face and side. A chalice was suspended in the air, catching his blood. Lucia understood this to be an image of the Holy Trinity. Beneath the right arm of the cross was Our Lady holding her immaculate heart, crowned with thorns and flames in her left hand. Under the left arm of the cross were the words, grace and mercy, written in crystal clear water running down upon the altar. Then Our Lady spoke to Lucia saying, the moment has come in which God asks the Holy Father, the Pope, in union with all the bishops of the world to make the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, promising to save it by this means. There are so many souls whom the justice of God condemns for sins committed against me that I have come to ask reparation. Sacrifice yourself for this intention and pray. All right, so in order to better understand and visualize this beautiful, mystifying apparition that Lucia is witnessing in the chapel, I've got an artistic rendition. So as you can see, you've got the Heavenly Father at the top with the illuminated dove at his chest. And then below you have Christ on the cross with his blood pouring from his side into the suspended chalice. Then you have Our Lady under the right arm of the cross with her immaculate heart encircled by thorns. And under the left arm of the cross, you have the clear water pouring down, spelling out the words grace and mercy. All right, so tons of stuff to think about right now. But the most important thing about all of this is that our Lord and our Lady, Jesus and Mary together, are commanding Lucia to spread throughout the world devotion to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart by communion of First Saturdays, which by the way, is for everyone to practice, not just for Lucia, not just for priests and religious, but for everyone to practice this communion of First Saturdays and the consecration of Russia. Long story short, Lucia communicates with her confessor and to her superiors of the importance of getting this devotion out to be practiced everywhere in the world but church leadership does not exactly all get up at once. Lucia experienced an intimate communion with the Lord in which he spoke to her saying, they did not wish to heed my request. Like the King of France, they will repent and do it, but it will be late. Russia will have already spread her errors throughout the world, provoking wars and persecutions of the church. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Now, real quick, what does our Lord mean when he says, like the King of France, they will repent and do it, but it will be late. We're getting into some real fine deets here. 
When he talks about the King of France, he's referring to the year 1689, one year before the death of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. Now, if any of you know the story of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, she was a French nun who began the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. St. Margaret Mary Alacoque was given a message from the Sacred Heart of Jesus to inform the King of France, King Louis XIV, the Sun King, to make a consecration to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. However, when she tried to pass this important message up through the authorities to reach the king, people dragged their feet and didn't take her seriously. I mean, why should we listen to some crazy nun? Sound familiar? It wasn't until a century later that the King of France, King Louis XVI, made the consecration to the Sacred Heart, but it was late and he did it from prison and he was guillotined on January 21st, 1793. Now that's a story for a different day, but it's very similar to the one I'm telling you now. All right, so back to the story. After these apparitions, Lucia made her perpetual vows on October 3rd, 1934, receiving the name Sister Maria das Dores, Mary of the Sorrows. Fast forward to the 25th of January, 1938, when a huge geomagnetic storm impacted the Earth, causing an aurora borealis to be visible all around the world. Remember, I mentioned this in part two. It was described as a curtain of fire and a huge blood red beam of light. Lucia understood this to be the unknown light that Our Lady was referring to in that July 1917 apparition when she said, when you see a night illuminated by an unknown light, know that this is a great sign given to you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Fathers. And what happened after 1938, the Nazis invaded Poland, and the rest is history. And it was throughout World War II, from 1941 to 1944, that Lucia was commanded by the Bishop of Leyra, José Alvas Correa de Silva, to write her memoirs, everything she remembered about the message of Fatima. It's almost as if, with this terrible war going on, which is much worse than the first one, people started thinking, maybe this crazy nun ain't so crazy after all. In 1946, Sister Lucia returned to Portugal and visited Fatima in secret and identified the Loca do Cabeso and the Cova de Iria, the sites of the apparitions. And with a renewed desire to live a life of peaceful, prayerful solitude, Sister Lucia obtained permission from Pope Pius XII to change from the Dorothean sisters to the Discalced Carmelites. And on March 25th, 1948, she entered the Carmelite convent of St. Teresa in Coimbra, Portugal, and she professed her vows as a discalced Carmelite on May 31st, 1949, taking the name Sister Lucia of Jesus in the Immaculate Heart, and she would reside at this convent all the way until her death. Okay, so some of you might be asking the question, what happens with this consecration of Russia? What happens after World War II when the Vatican starts kind of sort of taking the message of Fatima seriously? And what happened with the third part of the secret Fatima, in case you guys don't remember, that violent, perplexing vision that Our Lady showed the children back in the July 1917 apparition? Yeah, you remember this one? The Holy Father trembling with halting step up the mountain with the rough hewn cross. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. Now let's go back real quick to January 3rd, 1944, when Sister Lucia, by the order of the Bishop of Leyra, revealed the third part of the secret of Fatima. Now some of you might say, hold on a second, Our Lady said don't reveal the secret to anyone back in that July 1917 apparition. And Jacinta, one of her last words to Lucia before she died was do not reveal the secret to anyone, even if they kill you. And yes, she was commanded by Our Lady to keep it secret, but that was in 1917. But in 1944, when Lucia revealed the secret, it wasn't because she caved to the bishop's demands. It was because she had received, and she writes, she had received permission from heaven to do so. And just to reiterate, this was not a public revelation. This was a revelation strictly to the Bishop of Leyra and a select few group of clergy members. This manuscript written by Sister Lucia containing the secret of Fatima became a top secret document. And so we're gonna follow the trail of what happened to this secret document over the years. Years later, on April 4th, 1957, the sealed envelope containing the third part of the secret was placed in the secret archives of the Holy Office 
On August 17, 1959, the Commissary of the Holy Office, Father Pierre Paul Philippe, with the agreement of Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani, brought the envelope containing the third part of the secret to Pope John XXIII. After some hesitation, His Holiness the Pope said, We shall wait, I shall pray, I shall let you know what I decide. And the Pope later decided not to reveal the third part of the secret, and he returned the sealed envelope to the Holy Office. And on March 27, 1965, Pope Paul VI read the contents of the secret, but returned the envelope to the archives of the Holy Office, deciding not to publish the text. Sixteen years later, on the 13th of May 1981, an assassination attempt was made on Pope John Paul II. He was shot twice by a Turkish assassin named Mehmet Ali Agja while he was entering St. Peter's Square in Vatican City. Agja was immediately imprisoned, but pardoned by Italian President Carlo Ezeglio Ciampi at the request of John Paul II, who forgave him. Agja later converted to Catholicism in 2007. Now, after Pope John Paul II survived this assassination attempt, he asked to see Lucia's manuscript containing the third part of the Secret of Fatima. So as you probably heard in part two, you already know the third part of the Secret of Fatima written by Sister Lucia, but I'm gonna reread it here just for some clarification. And we saw in an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white, we had the impression was the Holy Father or the Pope. Other bishops, priests, and religious men and women were going up a steep mountain at the top of which there was a big cross of rough hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a city half in ruins and half trembling with halting step, Afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on the way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him, and in the same way there died one after the other, bishops, priests, religious men and women, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God." Now after Pope John Paul II read this third part of the secret, he couldn't help but draw some pretty curious comparisons between himself and this perplexing vision. For example, in the vision, the Holy Father dressed all in white, the Pope, is trembling with halting step up this mountain. Pope John Paul II had Parkinson's disease. And in the vision, the Holy Father is shot and killed by a group of soldiers. And Pope John Paul II had just survived an assassination attempt being shot twice. Now we're going to get more on this in just a second. Pope John Paul II composed a prayer called an Act of Entrustment, which was celebrated in the Basilica of St. Mary Major on June 7th, 1981, the Solemnity of Pentecost. And on March 25th, 1984, in St. Peter's Square, while recalling the fiat uttered by Mary at the Annunciation, Pope John Paul II, in spiritual union with the bishops of the world, consecrated the world, including Russia, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. During this consecration, he read the Act of Entrustment prayer which he composed three years prior. O Mother of all men and women and of all peoples, you who know all their sufferings and their hopes, you who have a mother's awareness of all the struggles between good and evil, between light and darkness, which afflict the modern world, accept the cry which we, moved by the Holy Spirit, address directly to your heart, embrace with the love of the mother and handmaid of the Lord, this human world of ours, which we entrust and consecrate to you. For we are full of concern for the earthly and eternal destiny of individuals and peoples. In a special way, we entrust and consecrate to you those individuals and nations which particularly need to be thus entrusted and consecrated. We have recourse to your protection, Holy Mother of God. Despise not our petitions in our necessities. Okay, so there are a ton of people out there who believe that this consecration was completely invalid and inconsistent with the specific request of Our Lady to consecrate Russia. They also say that it's been almost 40 years and Russia still hasn't converted, therefore the consecration must have been invalid. Okay, so two things here. Number one, 
Sister Lucia herself personally confirmed that Pope John Paul II's solemn and universal act of consecration corresponded to what Our Lady wished. She literally said, yes, it has been done just as Our Lady asked on the 25th of March, 1984. Her words, not mine. Secondly, Our Lady originally wanted the consecration to be done a long, long, long time ago. Remember when she said, if not, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world. She also said, however, that in the end, Russia will be converted. This might mean, however, that it might take a long time for the conversion to come to complete fulfillment. On April 19th, the year 2000, Pope John Paul II wrote a letter to Sister Lucia detailing his upcoming visit to Fatima on May 13th to perform a mass beatifying Lucia's two cousins, Francisco and Jacinta. On April 27th, Sister Lucia met with Archbishop Pertone, who was the secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, and Bishop Serafim de Souza Ferreira e Silva, who was the Bishop of Lera Fatima, have no idea if I pronounced that correctly, in the Carmelite convent of St. Teresa in Coimbra. So that was Sister Lucia's convent. They gave Lucia the envelope containing the original letter of the third part of the Secret of Fatima, written in Portuguese by Lucia. And when asked about the vision of the Holy Father being struck dead, Lucia was in full agreement with Pope John Paul II's claims that the vision pertained to him. And she agreed that it was the Mother, Our Lady's Hand, that guided the bullet's path, and in its throes the Pope halted the threshold of death. The bullet that shot John Paul II, by the way, was eventually taken from the jeep he was riding in at the time of the assassination and encrusted into the crown of the statue of Our Lady of Fatima at the Chapel of Apparitions that is in Fatima today. And here's a picture of that statue. You can actually, if you look closely, you can see the bullet encrusted into the top of the crown. Pope John Paul II said Mass at Fatima on May 13, 2000, the 83rd anniversary of the first vision of Our Lady, and beatified Francisco and Jacinta Marto. Sister Lucia died on February 13, 2005, in her convent, the convent of St. Teresa in Coimbra. And her cause for canonization opened in 2008, with Pope Benedict XVI granting a dispensation for the usually required five-year waiting period. More than 15,000 letters were collected supporting her cause for canonization. On the 100th anniversary of the first apparition of Our Lady, Pope Francis celebrated Mass at the Sanctuary of Our Lady of Fatima and solemnly canonized Francisco and Jacinta Marto. They are the youngest non-martyrs to be canonized saints in the history of the church, with Jacinta Marto being the youngest. In extremely recent news, on June 22nd, 2023, Pope Francis advanced the sainthood cause of Sister Lucia, and in a decree signed on June 22nd, the Pope recognized the heroic virtue of Sister Lucia and declared her venerable. So she is now venerable, Lucia of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart. So the Church just needs to approve a miracle in order for her beatification to proceed. All right, I will now finally conclude this video by sharing with you some key points of a profound interpretation of Fatima written by a man named Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who most of us know later became Pope Benedict XVI. At the time he wrote this interpretation of Fatima, he was the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. In this interpretation, one of his key points is that Fatima, rather than being some prophecy about the end of the world, is purely about changing the direction of humanity for the purpose of saving souls. He also says the vision of the third part of the secret of Fatima represents a century of violence and bloodshed. The cross is at the top of the mountain, the goal and guide of history. The ascent to the cross is arduous. The vision also showed the Holy Father shot and killed by soldiers. As we learned, this vision was interpreted as the assassination attempt survived by Pope John Paul II, who said that it was a mother's hand that guided the bullet's path, and in his throes the Pope halted the threshold of death. Cardinal Ratzinger writes, Prayer is more powerful than bullets, and faith more powerful than armies. 
The vision of the angels gathering the blood of the martyrs with the crystal aspersoriums is a powerful vision of the fruit of their sacrifice. The angels use the blood to give life to the souls making their way to God. The blood also runs down from the arms of the cross, meaning that their death becomes one with Christ's. They complete what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, and that's from Colossians 1.24. Cardinal Ratzinger also writes that the overall message is that the exhortation to prayer is the path for the salvation of souls, and likewise, the summons to penance and conversion. And finally, he mentions a key expression of the secret. Our Lady says, My immaculate heart will triumph. What does this mean? The heart open to God, purified by contemplation of God, is stronger than guns and weapons of every kind. The fiat of Mary, the word of her heart, has changed the history of the world because it brought the Savior. So what do we do now? Well, pray the rosary daily and do the first five Saturdays devotion. That is, on the first Saturday of five consecutive months to pray the rosary, go to confession on the day of or eight days prior to that Saturday, go to mass and receive communion, and meditate for 15 minutes on the mysteries of the rosary, all with the intentions of love for Jesus, conversion of sinners, and reparation for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And it's very important here to remember the words of Jesus to Sister Lucia when he appeared to her in the garden of the convent, when he told her that many people do this devotion just so they can get the graces, but it would please him more if you did it with fervor, with love for your mother, and with the intention of making reparations to her immaculate heart. Also, follow after the heroic example of the three children and find ways you can make sacrifices for sinners Fast a little bit more, drink a little bit less alcohol, eat less sweets, watch less TV, use your cell phone less. Ask for the intercession of St. Jacinta and St. Francisco. And when you're up at 2 o'clock in the morning taking care of sick, crying children, cleaning puke off the carpet, washing their sheets, you're tired and exhausted, simply fold your hands and say this little prayer. This is the path to heaven. And that's actually a little meditation I read from a Catholic mom. It's pretty amazing. All right, so with that, we will finally conclude this three-part Fatima series. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Also, please comment. I'm really interested to know your feedback, like if I got anything wrong, if you think my methods are flawed in any way, please let me know. I really wanna talk about this kind of stuff. Also, I highly recommend this book, which is what this whole three-part series is based on. It's a wonderful book, very detailed. So thank you guys so much again, and please pray for me. I am praying for you. God bless. Okay, bye.